Hello, everyone. We're so grateful to be with you today. My name is Thomas Holton, and I'm joined by Linda Cherry. Today, we want to have a discussion about Esther and a wonderful opportunity for us to reflect on this, this lady, this queen in, in all the best senses, in the, the best use of that word and her devotion to her father in heaven, her devotion to Mordecai, her devotion to the people of Israel, her devotion to her husband. There are so many wonderful things in here that I think are really relevant and pertinent for, for us. And I suppose I wanted to highlight the fact that Esther really is such a central figure in so many ways, a, a bridging figure, I think in the scriptures, in the old Testament, uh, recently president Nelson has spoken about how president Kimball gave a prophecy many years ago about how in the last days it would be righteous women who would sustain and defend the kingdom of God in the last days. And because of that example, many will be drawn to the church and kingdom. And I remember hearing that many years ago and thought, what a wonderful promise. And then of course, we know president Nelson has reiterated that and, and encouraged us that now is the time and that this is happening, that the righteous women are shining like a light uh, to the world and offering their voice and their faith and their testimony. And we should always remember that our faith and testimony can strengthen others. It's, it's, it's a powerful thing to have that gift and it's not for us ourselves only we're to share it. And of course, I am absolutely convinced that president Nelson is right, that these days in which we live, the sisters in Zion are doing a tremendous work and more to come, much more to come in the temples, in the mission field, in the church. And so I'm really struck by that, that Esther plays a central theme really in the scriptures in the house of Israel. And I think there are many lessons that we can learn from that. So Linda, is there anything you'd like to share with us at the outset that you think will be relevant for us to consider about Esther? Thank you, Tom. It's so great to be with you here today. I do think a little bit of historical context is helpful in understanding that Esther is a queen in the Persian court. Now, Babylon had conquered Jerusalem about a hundred years prior to Esther's story. And then Persians and Medes had joined together to conquer Babylon. And so we have the Persians who are in authority here over the Jewish people. Many, many of those people still in a sense of captivity in this kingdom, although there had been a previous release of the Jews who had wanted to go down and return to Jerusalem. Esther and her family are in Persia, and I love the meaning of Esther's name. Esther means star in Persian, and her original Jewish name is Hadassah, which means hidden. And so Esther really is a hidden star in the court of Persia in behalf of her people. I love the lesson that comes from Esther that no matter how small or insignificant we may feel we are, because let's face it, Esther is not the sort of queen or princess we see in Disney movies. She isn't allowed her own voice. She doesn't have the freedom to even enter into the king's presence whenever she wants to. She is very much a subject of the king. She is very much a subject of the way the culture was in this day in terms of women and how women were viewed as we will see as we progress in the story. And there are many of us who feel like we are small and we don't have a voice and there's nothing that we can contribute to the kingdom. But I love your pointing out both President Kimball and President Nielsen who have encouraged us as women today to raise our voices and raise our voices in behalf of truth and righteousness in raising our families, in the work that we do in building the kingdom. And I love looking at Esther as a wonderful example for us as how we can stand and speak and do mighty things, even when we feel that we are just a small person in the kingdom of God. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda. Absolutely agree with you. 
Okay, so let's start off looking at chapter one, which really lays the foundation uh, of what we're going to, to learn. And we know the situation, the king who wants to have a great feast and has a great feast and, and invites the nobles and the, the princes, princes and uh, lots of important people, what we might say VIPs in this day and age. And by reading the text, and I don't want to assume only negative about the king, but it certainly gives the impression that his primary interest was in showing his riches, showing his treasures, showing his prominence, his reach, and also showing the beauty of his wife, Vashti. Uh, obviously, she was very beautiful to look upon. And, and, and at one stage, he's, uh, he's quite drunk and he wants to show the beauty of his wife um, to the people who are there. And of course, his wife refuses to go. Now, we're not really given the reasons, doesn't explain why exactly. In this day and age, I think it would be very easy to relate to Vashti. Uh, from the king's point of view, he wants to be obeyed and he doesn't want to lose face. He wants everyone to think that he's the ruler and whatever he says goes. And uh, of course, the danger with that position is that sometimes people don't want to be viewed as just a trophy or viewed as just someone you possess, and especially your wife. So I think the king falls into that trap. And of course, we, we can all fall into these sorts of traps. So I'm not condemning the king per se, but I do think that um, it would have been helpful for him to be more reflective of the feelings of his wife. And certainly in this day and age, I think we would understand that. Um, he, he was very interested in his wise men's opinions. And of course they said, uh, put your wife away essentially. And, and that's what he did. I think it's interesting. There are some lessons we can learn from this. Um, it, some of the lessons I think are that people are more important than things. They're more important than possessions. They're more important than influence or status or notoriety. Now, of course, that's an easy lesson to preach, but not so easy to live. And all of us are tempted to perhaps treat others as instruments that we can use them for our own purposes. And in the gospel, of course, the gospel teaches us that people are the children of God. All of us are the children of God and we are created in his likeness and his image. And sometimes I think we define ourselves by reference to our status or maybe how we look or how tall we are or how famous we are, how rich we are. And it's very easy to fall into that trap. And the gospel teaches us that our core identity is rooted in our relationship to God. President Nelson has spoken recently about this. And I love the fact that he, he spoke about how his identity is rooted in himself as a, a child of God, as a son of the covenant, and as a disciple of Christ. I'd never heard it put exactly that way before. And I, I thought that was, that was wonderful. And to try and remember that that each of us are created in the image and likeness of God and our eternal worth is far more than the temporary status we have or the things we've achieved. And also I've been struck by this idea of what we appear to be to others, that, you know, goodness and character is more important than appearances, more important than, than fame and fortune and fame and fortune aren't bad things in their way, they, they can help people to do lots of good, but they shouldn't be a substitute for the character and the goodness that comes with the gospel. Um, Linda, I'm interested in hearing your insights, especially as a sister in the gospel, in terms of this narrative and what, what you think is going on here. Well, it's something that really stands out to me is I was thinking about how we're talking about an entirely different culture here where women are considered lesser. Vashti is considered to be a possession of the king in a certain way. And I was contrasting that with what the Lord teaches us about a covenant marriage. And that even if we look back in very, very many years prior to this story to Abraham and Sarah or Moses and Zipporah, we see equality in a marriage where both are honored, both are exalted, both are cherished. 
Paul teaches us that neither is the man without the woman, nor the woman without the man in the Lord. And I'm just so grateful that we've had the restoration today of the covenant values and the understanding of what a marriage is meant to be. And I'm just so grateful that uh, we live in this time and that we have these truths restored. And I, you know, my heart aches, to be honest with you, for Vashti, uh, that she's put in this position where in order to sort of defend uh, her own uh, modesty, if you will, as you say, it appears that he wants to show her off. We don't know all of her reasons, but uh, modesty was a very important part of this culture as well for women. And that in her desire to uh, protect her modesty, she determines that she's not going to go uh, before the king and his drunken friends. And then it's so interesting that the wording of his counselors uh, to the king are, well, she's going to give ideas to other women. And if you let her, if you let her get away with this, then other women will rise up and not obey their husbands. Well, this is something, again, that I love about what we're taught about what it means to be a covenant people and what a covenant relationship or a covenant marriage is. And in fact, the Savior himself refers to himself as a bridegroom and tells us in Jeremiah and Isaiah and other chapters that he's married to us. So we might look at the way that the Savior wants to raise the members of the church, wants to exalt each and every one of us as his bride, as is uh, referred to in the book of Revelation and in other areas of the scriptures, that how does the, how does the Lord treat us? How does the Lord act towards us? And this is the best example that we have in how we should treat our, the members of our families. And um, so I appreciate the things that you said about this sense of people are more important than things and how we look and how our status is. Thank you for that, Tom. I absolutely, completely agree. I think in the temple, uh, we all dress in white and really there's no distinction there between prince and pauper, between male and female, uh, rich and poor. And that sense of equality before God. Um, and it's such an important reminder for, for each one of us. And so, yes, absolutely. I think it's, it's interesting to contrast that, that treatment that we have and um, the treatment we give to, to other people, people who are above us in station and people who are below us in a sense, there's a democracy in the gospel that we don't really find in the world, but in the gospel, we're all, um, on the same level, if we like. Okay. So let's have a look at chapter two. And you've already mentioned this, Linda, and I think this is absolutely wonderful because we know when I was growing up, I actually didn't realize, I thought Esther's name was Esther. I didn't realize that her name was Hadassah, uh, which was her original name. Obviously, Esther was the new name given to her. And this idea of names is very important is in the gospel. We know that names, for example, we receive a new name at the time of baptism. We take upon ourselves the name of Christ, or we express that we're willing to do so. And um, as President Oaks has pointed out, and over a lifetime, we grow into the full stature of that name. And with that name comes power, comes identity, comes reassurance, comes clarity about who we really are. So I think we're really blessed in the gospel because we have our own name, our family name. We have our individual name, and that of course is a source of honor hopefully, if we, if we live true and faithful, but we also have the new name of Christ that's placed upon us in our hearts, uh, as the book of Mormon teaches that we receive that name by covenant and promise, as long as we live worthy of it and try to repent of our sins. And then of course, as we go to the temple, we know that, uh, we are blessed to receive a new name and we won't talk about that too much, but, but the idea that with that name comes understanding and comes identity and comes purpose and, and, and a sense of mission. As we know, in the old Testament names were just picked out of a hat. The names were given by revelation and inspiration. Each child of God was given a name to indicate their mission on the earth. Um, and so 
in a way, this is almost the contrast of that. It's the opposite of that in the sense of Fadassa becomes Esther. Now, thankfully, uh, Esther doesn't lose her sense of origin. She doesn't lose her sense of belonging. And of course, the key concept of covenant belonging in the house of Israel is something we should always remember and never forget. And that's very difficult to do, especially when we're tried and tested in difficult circumstances. Now, I love the fact that Esther really kept a sense of who she was. And that was obviously not easy. And the king was very impressed with her. And I don't think it was just because she was really pretty looking, which obviously she was from the text, but there's a bit more, there's a substance to her soul. There's a sense that she's a woman that has virtue and integrity. And that, that's so important because it's not always easy to be true to your principles, especially when it's not popular. Um, and so I, I love the fact that, um, Esther was presented before the king and she didn't lose her values. She didn't, lose, she didn't morph into something to be popular or to say, oh, well, I want to be liked uh, by the king. And so I'll just modify my behavior to be like everyone else. And you, I think there's a lot of important lessons for us to reflect on in this day and age. When we come to favor or prominence, it can be easy to forget God or to forget our parents and what they taught us or to forget our spiritual identity. And it's important that we, we don't do that. So Linda, I'm very interested in your thoughts about this, how Esther kept her resolve, her courage under fire, if you like. Well, it's interesting to me to consider the fact that from this point on, whenever Esther communicates with her cousin Mordecai, it's through another person. In other words, Esther, as was the rule for women in those days, is basically locked inside of the palace. And so she's really on her own as far as a covenant member of the family of Israel. And it reminds me very much, I think often of her story in conjunction with the story of Joseph who was sold into Egypt or Daniel and his friends that were taken to the court of Babylon in that they are all these young people who somehow retain the remembrance of what it means to be a member of covenant Israel, even though they are now in a position where they are surrounded by people who know nothing of that covenant, who would live in an entirely different way. And all three of these, Daniel, Esther, and Joseph of Egypt, seem to be in a position of wealth and prestige and yet retain their humility and retain their dedication to God and a sense of commitment to their people. All three of them look to the sense of how can I help and aid others? How can I be a blessing to others? How can I radiate or magnify the name of God in my present circumstances? When you spoke about names, Israel is the name of God's covenant family. And so, as you say, they've taken themselves upon, upon themselves the name of God and what is inherent in that promise of our taking upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ, or in their case, the name of Jehovah, is the promise that he will send us forth, as you mentioned, on our missions, and he'll empower us to be able to perform our missions. And so we see with Esther, Daniel, Joseph of Egypt, the sense in all three of them, and in Esther, we're just at the beginning of this growing sense of what her mission is as that comes to her uh, through this experience that she has in the court. But this sense that they have that they are a part of a greater plan of the Lord and that they will seek his will and that they will manifest the, the beauties and simplicity. One thing that stands out to me about Esther is that when she is being prepared to be presented to the king, she's very simple in her tastes. Um, she she is granted that she can she can request a number of different things and she's uh, basically she's probably in some sort of harem kind of uh, circumstances here where there are eunuchs who will bring her clothing or precious oils or perfumes or things like that and it appears that Esther remains quite simple in her taste she um, is pleasing to everyone around her because she's humble 
and she is sweet. She is not seeking to exercise power over others. There's this sense of kindness uh, that is projected in, her, in the story about her. And again, these are all character traits that as members of the family of the covenant of Israel, that these are, these are characteristics that we would want to be projecting to others in similar circumstances, in all the circumstances of our lives, to be as much like the Savior as we possibly can. That, that's exactly right, Linda. Um, it really is so true. And, and obviously for Esther to maintain her composure in a situation like that could not have been easy. And rightly so, Joseph in Egypt and, and many others, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which again are the names that were given to them, not their original names. And, and they remember their covenant in circumstances which were challenging. So that's such an important reminder to all of us. Okay, so in chapter three, we continue in a way on this theme that being a covenant person is not always popular and it's rarely, if ever, easy. And um, we know that Haman was, was honored by the king, but Mordecai did not honor Haman. And um, obviously we're not told exactly why, but Mordecai is a man of discernment and wisdom. He senses, I think, that um, Haman is not to be trusted, and he turns out to be right. Uh, but it's just interesting that Haman was granted authority to kill the Jews. And that's interesting because Mordecai obviously then realized he was in a precarious situation, uh, the threat of, of losing his life, and not just him, but all the Jews. And of course, this is a situation which the people of Israel have faced again and again um, throughout the, the biblical text and, of course, uh, right through to today. Um, and the people of faith who are willing to follow God, that's not going to be an easy journey. It's not going to be a picnic, a walk in the park. And it's not intended to be. I think sometimes we think, our discipleship is the promise of ease. And uh, when we join the church, we should join a place of safety and ease and comfort. And that's a very easy trap to fall into. I remember growing up um, in our situation, we joined the church in 1976 in Ireland. And I can tell you back then it was quite religiously difficult. We were in very much a minority situation and there was a lot of persecution. Uh, for being members of the church. One stage, I remember about 20 teenagers pushed our door in and, and came in and threatened my mother's life and said, you need to leave this place um, or we'll kill you. And we were actually, I was only about 10 at the time. We were only in the church, maybe seven or eight years at that stage. Um, and so my mum obviously, I don't, I don't know exactly how she did it, but the spirit was with her. She was able to talk them off the ledge, off the precipice and calm things down and they left. And, um, I, what an interesting example. I know at one stage she felt like we had to leave that area because it was just so dangerous. A number of other incidents where our, our house was attacked and um, in various ways, set on fire and things like that. And I remember at one stage, she prayed to the Lord one night and she said that she just needed peace and she felt the presence of the Lord in her room at her bedside, saying that he was going to take care of her and her, her three boys, and that everything would be okay. And she felt such a blanket of peace. I remember her telling me about that at the time Now we were young, we were too young to fully understand all the complications. My mom was a single mother at that time. So, um, the Lord helped us to move and by a miracle, we were able to buy a house in a, in a different area because this was social housing we were living in. There was a lot of trouble in the area. It was very economically disadvantaged. And this was actually 1980s Ireland, which was already 
Ireland was a very poor country at that time. And we were even the poorest of the poor. And um, at one stage, my mother was surviving on baby food herself, eating baby food because she didn't have money to buy food beyond that. She had to feed us. And, uh, of course the church was a great resource. I remember one brother, a, quite a big man, six foot one and, and big. And he came to the house as our home teacher. And this was 40 years ago. And I remember he went in and had a conversation with some of the people in the area and encouraged them that they needed to be careful about how they treated our family. And uh, I think they got the message to a degree. Anyway, they stopped giving us so much hassle, but there was still, there was still hassle. There was still difficulty. There was still threats to a degree, but I was grateful for that priesthood holder. And, and of course, uh, there are some times when priesthood holders have to be like Captain Moroni and be strong and brave and other times when they need to be soft and tender and kind. And this brother did both. So I was grateful for that, but that highlights that in our, in our lives, we're going to have those situations where we come under fire. It may not be, um, exactly how it is in the scriptures, uh, but it may be similar to it. And as we know, in this situation, um, Mordecai was faithful to his faith as was Esther. Um, and it wasn't easy for them, but that determination to act bravely in the face of danger, that's, that's something that is to be admired and to be respected. And I, I, I'm grateful for those people in the scriptures who had that courage under fire. I'm interested in your thoughts on that, Linda. Well, I certainly can't do anything but say thank you for sharing that powerful story about your mother and your family. That is just beautiful. I hope you'll share even more with us. Thank you for that. Okay, so let's have a look at chapter four. And again, this continues the, the theme that our commitment to God requires real courage, real determination, real faith. And in order to be real, those things have to be tested. And obviously that isn't always a popular message. It isn't an easy message, but the Lord knows what he's doing and he knows how to make us great. And greatness really is born out of tribulation and um, it's born out of difficulty. That that's how we grow. It's the only way we grow is by being compelled to face difficult circumstances. So we know that Mordecai, Esther, and all the Jews were mourning together or separately, individually and in unity because of this, this threat of death, this, this edict that would, would take away their mortal lives. And Mordecai basically asked Esther to supplicate the king to preserve the lives of the people. Now, on the face of it, this might seem like a, a fairly routine thing to do or an obvious thing to do. It's important to understand that you don't go in to the room of the king and supplicate him unless you're invited. And also, I think it's important to mention that we've already talked about how Vashti um, didn't fare well when she refused the, the directions of the king. So the king was used to getting his own way. This was a king with a lot of power and authority. And so what Esther is being asked to do here is to supplicate the king in situation where she's not invited and where the king doesn't have to accede to her request. He, he's the king. He, he doesn't have to listen. And, and obviously this is a risk of her losing her own life. Um, so this is a treacherous situation. This is precarious to say the least. And again, sometimes when we read the scriptures, we may not, we may just rush over things without really thinking how the person feels. And I try to think myself, well, how did this person feel? And all you have to do is ask yourself, when was the last time the Lord gave you a difficult challenge? For example, when the bishop calls you into the office and says, okay, we want you to be gospel doctrine teacher. And you're, you're, you nearly faint because you think I, what do I know? I can't teach. I had that experience, by the way, I was called, I was just back from my mission. I was called to be gospel doctrine teacher. I was pretty confident because I just served as a missionary, but I learned that I, it was a, it was a challenging calling because you have to teach the gospel in a situation where you're going to be challenged. 
people are going to say things that you hadn't thought of, or that might, they might contradict or disagree with what you've thought. And that's in the church. Imagine uh, like in the book of Mormon, where uh, the sons of Messiah wanted to go and preach to the Lamanites, the, the murderers, and they told their father about it. And their father was worried that they would die in the attempt. So these are real risks and real situations. They're not fabricated. They're not, um, they're not situations that, uh, there's no risk. There is a risk here. She was the queen, but she felt it would be a challenge. Linda, you want to comment? Well, I was just going to say, I want to point out that the king did not know that Esther was a Jew or a member of the family of Israel. And Mordecai, in fact, had counseled her not to reveal that previous to this time. When Haman became convinced that the way to best punish Mordecai was to kill all the Jews, uh, it's because, well, he was talking over with someone else about how Mordecai wouldn't bow before him. Uh, they determined that these people, the Jewish people in general, were not bowing because they would only bow before their own God. And that also uh, they brought this, um, uh, uh, I'm so sorry, they brought this accu accusation that by not bowing, they were therefore a rebellious people. And that's how they were able to convince the king that it would be best for him to get rid of these people out of his kingdom because they won't bow before Haman or perhaps even others. They'll only bow before their God. They're rebellious. They're going to cause all kinds of trouble for you. And so that's how they convinced the king in the first place. And, and Esther had not revealed that she was a Jew. And so it's a tremendously scary situation for her to be in. Um, this brings up this one part of the, of Mordecai's counsel to her that, you know, just sort of rings for me as a woman and in my particular circumstances in life that, um, have really this particular counsel that he gave her has really impelled and informed the decisions that I make in my life. And that is that he told her that if she did not speak up, First of all, he believed that the Lord would send someone else who would deliver and help them, help his people. But he said, if you don't speak up, you're going to lose your life anyway. And then he says to her, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And this particular counsel that Mordecai gives to Esther, I think really applies to every human child of our Father in heaven, is that each one of us has been appointed and come to this earth with a very specific mission or missions to fulfill. And we can change that word kingdom to be the kingdom of the Lord. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? We can look at Joseph of Egypt, or we could look at Daniel, we can look at Esther, and we can easily identify Oh, yes, we know that the Lord had sent them specifically now for this purpose. We can look at King Josiah, for example, who as an eight-year-old came to the throne. And even though he had had wicked progenitors, he immediately started to cleanse the temple and he brought all of his people back into the covenant. And we can say, we can really note and, and be convinced that the Lord had sent Josiah for that purpose. But it's very important for each of us to ask the Lord and to go to the Lord and, and, and ask him to reveal to us the purposes for which he has sent us to earth at this time. That even as Esther was able to have such an impact upon her people, each one of us can also have an impact and the Lord needs us to use us. Whether that's, that's the gospel doctrine teacher, Tom, or the nursery leader, or as a mother or father, or a neighbor, or someone who might be running for a political office, that the Lord will reveal to us what it is, the reason he sent us here and now. And I just have such a strong witness and testimony of this myself. So Linda, I think that's absolutely right. I, I love that. And a couple of things that I'd like to reinforce there, one about the idea of Esther hadn't revealed that she was of the house of Israel. And all you have to do is think about, have you ever had a situation where you are required to reveal your true identity, especially to someone who you, you might think might cause you trouble. 
I think we've all had situations like that. And that is, that is a difficult thing to do. It requires real internal strength and a sense of commitment. So that's no easy challenge. And she did it. I mean, that's the reality. She could have hid away from it. She could have shied away. And many of us might've thought, well, I can understand why she did shy away if she did, but she didn't, she faced, she faced it. And that's, that's absolutely tremendous. And it's a real source of hope and encouragement to us that we will be called upon to face some fears. You know, I often think the Lord calls us to face our fear. He, he, he gives us an opportunity to confront the very thing we're afraid of and the growth that comes from doing that. There's, there simply is no comparison. I've had a number of times in my life where I've had to confront fears and, uh, it's easy to run away from them. And I have done that. And then I've realized, oh, this is going to keep confronting me and, until I do something with it. And so the Lord is wise. I'm also struck by this, uh, concept you've, you've mentioned, which I think is so powerful. Uh, who knoweth but that thou art come to the kingdom for a time such as this. I think that is such a pertinent idea and it really is so relevant because the number of people who've said to me in the last couple of years is the second coming, coming soon, you know, because there's a real sense of end times. Now I'm not an alarmist and I don't think we ought to be fanatics about it and get scared. I do think we need to be, have our house in order and we need to be prepared. And it strikes me that, uh, we're in a situation now in the church and in the world where it's very difficult for us not to be confronted. We, we, the neutrality, if we were able to be neutral before, we can't really be neutral now. And so we have to confront our destiny. And I often think we trust that God has placed us in this situation at this time for a reason. And we have the gifts, we have the abilities and the characteristics and the inclinations that are suited to the circumstances of today. Uh, and sometimes we might think, oh, I wish I was born in a different time, but really this is the time. And, you know, I often think when we die and we look back on our mortality, we'll say that was the one opportunity I had that mortality. It's so, it's so quick. It's so brief. And it's so important to use it and not run away from our destiny. And again, I know that it, it isn't the easy thing to do, but it's so important. And I really believe that we have, we have skills and we have unique talents that are particularly needed for this day and this age in the church and kingdom. So I absolutely agree with you. I think it's so important for each one of us to go to the Lord. Uh, like President Nelson has been saying, and other apostles spend quiet time with the Lord each day and figure out what we're sent here to do and make sure we don't leave th that work undone. And, and Esther fulfilled that destiny. Hadassah fulfilled her covenant oath. She did what she was assigned to do. And I think there's no better feeling than knowing you're, you're doing what the Lord has appointed you to do. And it, it may not be something big. We have a tendency sometimes to judge things in terms of scope or scale. We think, well, the bigger it is or the more visible, the more important. I'm like, well, there are many things that the Lord is, is doing in quiet in, 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 you know, that are small, but they are nevertheless significant and important. So yeah, I absolutely agree. I think we need to find out what, what can we do? What gifts do we have to offer? And we might not think we have any gifts, but we, we actually do. We have gifts to offer. And so the Lord, not, sorry, the Lord, the Lord will magnify those gifts. I'll just share that when I was, I joined the church when I was 17, I was raised in a very, very, what was then called anti-Mormon environment. And it was quite a challenge for me to, to join the church. I loved what you said about facing your fears brings about the greatest blessings and growth in our lives, because that's certainly been the case for me. Uh, my parents were very unhappy about my joining the church. Uh, I won't go into a great de deal of detail um, out of respect for them. Uh, it wasn't as difficult as your mother. I didn't have, I wasn't threatened to have my house burned down, but I was very much on my own and alone as a 17 year old. Uh, with the way that I had been raised, I 
uh, was a very shy, very introverted, very fearful person. I was raised in the heart of L.A., and I genuinely thought that I had nothing to offer um, to the Lord or to his kingdom and specifically to the church. To be honest with you, I was just in awe of every person in the church. And I, I'm sure you've witnessed, as I have, that so many of these young people that are raised in primary just make the best leaders, speakers, teachers. And you see them excelling in school and being chosen to uh, give talks at school, graduation speeches and that sort of thing because of the experience they've had from being raised in giving talks, even as a primary child. And so as a 17 year old, I felt I was very behind, very awkward, very inadequate to offer or give anything uh, to the church. And I, and I just loved the church so much. And I remember the first callings I've had, had the very first calling I had actually was as 17, I was called to teach 27 three-year-olds without a teen teacher. And I didn't even question that I might have a teen teacher. I just so much wanted to please the Lord and and bless those children and not let anyone down. It was a very fearful experience for me that ended up being a very powerful experience. And the first time I was ever called on to give a, a talk in church or to teach a lesson, I remember that I just wrote down every single word and I was holding the three by five cards and I was just shaking and terrified and Literally one time I even fainted when I was giving a talk because I felt so inadequate to it. But I have found through my own personal experience that when we go to the Lord with our weakness and acknowledge our weakness and, and recognize we can't do anything without him, but with such an intense desire to serve, to please him, to show him our gratitude through our service, that the Lord magnifies those gifts, even if they feel very small to us, the Lord will magnify those gifts and he will use them and we will be blessed for them. I can honestly say, as did King Benjamin, and I know you would say the same thing, there's no service I have ever performed in the church that I did not receive tenfold back for any tiny thing that I ever did or, or ever gave. Forgive me for getting so emotional about it. But I was just really struck when you said, when we face our fears, when we go into our fears, as Esther had to do here, uh, we are greatly blessed. And the most uh, kind of revealing thing to me is that the Lord has shown me, revealed to me the strength that I never knew I had uh, through those very challenging, frightening experiences. But I, I have to emphasize, I could never have done them without him. I could have never gone forward without him and without his help. And Esther here calls upon the Lord before she goes into the king. I think it's very important for us to recognize that she asked that her people would fast and pray for three days and nights so that she had that additional strength of all of these folks united in the prayer of their heart that God would help deliver them and that he would strengthen Esther in this work that she was about to do. This is one of the great blessings we have as being a body of saints, of being a community family in the church where we aren't alone, where we have the prayers of the saints that help to strengthen, uplift us as we go forward in performing the missions the Lord has called us to do. I, I can really relate to that, Linda, just briefly. When the first time I gave a talk at sacrament meeting, I was 10 years of age. I was very shy as a, as a child, very shy. I was so nervous. It was a two and a half minute talk. And this was back. This is a long time ago. This is 40 years ago. So I was so nervous. I stood to speak at the pulpit and I was shaking. I was shaking like a tree in the wind and my palms were sweaty. I could barely see my page. I could barely speak because my mouth was so dry. And I raced through what I had to, to say. I didn't know at the time that sometimes people say no to talk. <laughs> I, I, did, I wasn't brought up to say no. I was brought up to say yes. And, and I gave that talk and I sat down. I was so nervous. I can't explain how nervous I was. And um, I, I'm so glad I said yes. Because since that time, I've literally given hundreds of talks and firesides and now I love speaking and teaching. I love it. 
It was my favorite, I was gospel doctrine teacher twice and, and I loved it. It was my favorite calling. And it's just interesting because the Lord really does take you as you are. And if you're willing, uh, Elder Maxwell used to say that all you have to show to the Lord is that you're willing, you're available and he'll magnify you and make you capable beyond what you could ever be without him. And so I know that I know what you're saying is true because I've had the experience where I grew up told people would call it social anxiety now, where I was literally frightened to talk to people. And, and, and now I can speak and there was 120 people in that room and to have a 10 year old speak to them. Uh, so the Lord does ask us to do hard things, but he doesn't leave us alone and he, he magnifies us. So I just love that. And I think you're right. Esther really did rise to the challenge here. She was a tremendous woman and a great example to all of us in the house of Israel. Let's, uh, let's look at chapter five briefly. So the core theme of this really is that the righteous are going to face both favor and persecution in this life. You're, you're always going to get a mix of those things. It's never going to be plain sailing, but there will be many great moments of joy and peace and happiness and sweet, sweet blessings. We know that the king welcomes Esther and, and he offers half his kingdom to her actually, which is a nice surprising request. Makes me think of the book of Mormon, where we have a similar offer when, uh, when, um, Aaron, um, is teaching the king and there are people who are willing to hear our message. And sometimes we're more afraid than they are. They're willing to, to listen to what we have to say. So it's important to trust. We know that Haman was angry with Mordecai. Uh, we know that Haman was full of pride. Really. He wanted to be ascendant above others, which we know is the great state of pride that Lucifer wanted to be above us. And that's what caused his fall. And, and obviously he wanted to kill Mordecai. Uh, and actually it's interesting because his wife agrees with him. Haman's wife sort of plots with him. And I just find that interesting. That seems to be a theme in the scriptures where some husbands and wives are very united in righteousness and others seem to be united in wickedness. Uh, how important it is in that context to know who you're listening to, who are you going to take advice from, who are you going to, whose counsel will you follow? Because some counsel isn't worth following. Um, and obviously that's what's going on here, because this is going to turn out bad as we know for, for Haman. I think it's so important that pride always leads to a downfall to remember that in the scriptures, I can't think of a single case where pride actually benefited the person who held it. It always leads to downfall. And, um, and so we, we need to trust in God and, and realize that even though probably a sign that something is good is the fact that we're afraid of it. That's actually a better sign. If we're not afraid of it, it's not much of a test. God isn't calling us to be comfortable. He's calling us to stretch ourselves. So I love that. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I just want to, I was really struck by what you just said, that God isn't calling us to be comfortable because it, we do seem to live in a time when people are most concerned about their safety. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, the age of COVID just really hit everyone really hard where they had the sense they need to stay in their homes and they're so afraid they're going to get hurt. I've thought often about the early pioneers or even these stories from the Old Testament where they're required to cross a desert in the midst of bandits or not have food in the case of Elijah and uh, Esther here who asked to come into the presence of the king when you're not allowed to go unless you've been invited. And, and our early pioneers who crossed the plains you know, this was not a time of safety. This is really interesting that you said that, that God does call us to do the difficult and challenging things. And so I feel like we do need to have a change in our mindset from what is currently so prevalent in the world today of, I, I'm just going to keep myself safe. I'm just going to keep myself locked up in my, in my home because we can't affect other people if we're locked up in our home. We have to venture forth. We, we have to cross the desert. Uh, metaphorically, um, in order to be able to serve others and to build the kingdom of God. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that that's powerful that you've said that. And I, I think that's so true that we need to have bravery 
and bravery implies that there's a risk. And I know we're, a lot of us are risk averse, but, um, we're afraid of so many things, but the, the joy we feel when we face our fear of water or our fear of other people or our fear of heights or the fear of authority, whatever it is. And, and the Lord does want us to grow and that involves growing pains. And so I, I think that's one of those doctrines that stretches us, but it also comforts us to know that the Lord trusts us enough that we can do these hard things. That that's, it's a compliment from the Lord, really. Right. If, if we view it positively. I think it goes back to that saying that the Lord knew what Abraham would do when the Lord asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac, but that what was needed there was Abraham to know who Abraham was. And I think that you're right, that it is through these great challenges that the Lord reveals to us also our potential and reveals to us who we are as his children. And again, he wants to exalt us. He wants us to, he wants to lift us. He wants us to become like him. And we certainly don't see any fear in, in the way that the Lord manifests himself or the way that he goes forward. So thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it, Tom. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think of the prophet Joseph Smith who received the same promises that were given to Abraham and Joseph was worthy of them. He, in his 38 years, he achieved so much and the Lord tested him in the sense that he stretched him, but Joseph rose to the challenge and those blessings are with us. They're with the church. They're with the people. We, th those blessings can be with the entire world. If they want them, we're happy to give the blessings of the, the patriarchal order uh, to all the world and the spirits in the spirit world. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, greatness is born out of difficulty us facing our fears. Okay. So we've got a, just a few chapters um, left. Chapter six, we know that the theme is that the Lord is watching over his covenant people. He seeks to bless us. He has a plan for us. We don't always see the end from the beginning, but he does. He knows what, he, what we're heading for. And so we need to trust him. And trust can be a difficult thing sometimes for people because they want to see the end from the beginning. But in my experience, the Lord wants us to take that trust, that leap of faith. He wants us to venture out into the unknown and we'll find that he's there. He's willing and waiting on the other side, whether it's the, you know, the veil of death, whether it's the veil of the temple, whatever veil that we have to pass through, he's on the other side, e eager for us to come. We know that the king was seeking to honor Mordecai. And this is such an interesting drama. This is spiritual drama. Haman was looking for permission from the king to kill Mordecai. And uh, so it's ironic because actually the pride that Haman has actually ends up benefiting Mordecai in this situation. How would you, how would you, how should the, the king treat someone who wants to honor? And of course, Haman's thinking about himself, but actually he's benefiting Mordecai. And, and I find it interesting that Haman is advised by his wife that he won't prevail against Mordecai. That's a very interesting situation. It's almost as if they come to a realization that, uh, they, their plan, which was hatched in the darkness is not going to be approved. I mean, God, God doesn't endorse that, which is hatched in secrecy and conspiracy. He, he lives in the light. And so they start to realize this is not going to end well. And so the lessons from that, as I've thought about that, I've realized that, uh, those, those things, you know, our pride does lead to a fall and we need to have a faith and a, a patience in God that he will, he will bring those blessings to us. And it really takes courage. It takes faith. It takes humility but our faithfulness is rewarded. I'd love to hear your thoughts about those events, Linda. Well, it is such an interesting story, as you said, high spiritual drama, that, uh, that in the middle of the night, the king remembers that he owes Mordecai uh, honor because Mordecai had revealed sometime previously a plot against his life. And Mordecai had shared that plot with Esther, who had told the king and prevented this uh, danger to the king. And it's interesting because the king had seemingly forgotten all about it. 
And then in the middle of the night, right in the middle of Haman's plan to have Mordecai killed, the king remembers, oh, I owe Mordecai, Mordecai something for having alerted me to this plot against my life. And he goes to Haman of all people and says, how should I honor someone who has done something really great for me? Haman thinks that the king is speaking of himself. He doesn't realize that, ha that the king is speaking of Mordecai. And Haman makes this suggestion, well, I would put the royal clothing on him. I'd put him on a, on a horse and I'd take him through the streets of the city and have everybody give praise and honor to this person. Because again, this is what Haman wants for himself. And the king says, great idea. Now go do this for Mordecai. And in fact, Haman had to be the one who would take Mordecai through the streets. So it's interesting, as you say, that the Lord is very aware of the plots that are happening in the dark. He brings them uh, to light and he kind of turns all of this on its head. Uh, he, the Lord will honor his people and those who remain true to him. And it's a beautiful story. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it is. It's always interesting to see how the Lord is more intelligent than the devil. And uh, the cunning of the evil one always falters. And the Lord is smart. He's more intelligent than we give him credit for. And he can help us in so many ways. He can help us to realize what's going on. And that gift of discernment, so important to detect and discern um, these, these things that are going on, these plots. Okay, so chapter 8. We know that God, the God of Israel, will surprise us by confounding his enemies. Uh, we just have to wait in patience, and we know that that will happen. We know that Mordecai is honored, and Esther supplicates for the Jews, and the king actually reverses the, this decision that was made originally. So the Jews are able to protect their lives, to safeguard themselves, and also to avenge their enemies and to rejoice. And I love the fact that they rejoice and they, they meet together and they rejoice together. It's a little bit like what happened after the lockdowns and COVID. And we all got together as Latter-day Saints and family and friends, and we were able to rejoice um, in that opportunity to commune together and to share our faith uh, together. Some of the lessons I think from this is that, that God really has power to fulfill his promises. We may not protect that. We may not see how he has that power. Uh, from the outset, we, we may wonder how God will achieve the things he's going to achieve, but he will achieve them. They might seem impossible, but he will, he will bring it about in miraculous ways. Um, I love the fact that God brings about life when there's a, a, a threat of death. And we see that in so many ways, as we know, uh, with Pharaoh uh, chasing Moses and his people. And obviously they wanted to kill them and the Red Sea parted. The Lord brought life where there was the threat of death. And I think that's a common theme. We worry, we worry so much about death. We worry so much about mortality. And the Lord has foreseen all that. He's prepared a plan that uh, death is not the end. And so many times in the scriptures, that's shown to us again and again, that death is just a transition point. And so even though we fear for our lives and we want to be alive, we want to keep our mortality, we know in certain situations, um, the righteous lose their lives, their mortal lives, but they keep their spiritual lives. And so it's always important to remember that. Um, and Elder Holland spoke about that recently at a conference for every situation where Daniel is preserved in the lion's den, Abinadi is burned at the stake, but they're both faithful. Different outcome in the short term, but in the long term, they'll both be saved. So one of the, the things I was thinking about when I read this chapter was, how can I keep in my mind that God's promises are sure when things look bleak? So I'm interested to hear your thoughts about that, Linda. Well. And, and kind of just as a rewind of something that you just shared, Esther did say before she went into the king, when she had made the decision, she would speak for her people. She did say, if I perish, I perish. Much, much as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were faced with the fiery furnace, 
said, God is able to deliver us, but if not, we will not worship. We will not fall down before another God. So I love that you contrasted Abinadi giving his life, Daniel's life preserved, and Esther here, who also has the same attitude of, if I perish, I perish, but I need to do, I need to do what the Lord has called me to do with this perspective of eternal life. And that really losing our mortal life is not the worst thing that can happen to us. Losing our spiritual life, losing our spiritual integrity, losing a place in the kingdom of God in the celestial kingdom, that is a true, a true tra uh, tragedy that could happen to us. And so I love how that is pointed out here in the scriptures. Absolutely. Totally agree. It's so true to keep that in perspective. Our eternal life is important uh, in a way that mortality isn't. But obviously we want to keep our mortal lives for as long as we can. But it is important to keep it in, in perspective. Then chapter 9, um, honor comes to those who follow God in the long run. And it is a long-term strategy. God is playing the long-term game. And sometimes we have a tendency to see things in the here and now, if we don't get a blessing immediately, or if things turn out in a way that's different to what we anticipate, our expectations are breached. And that can be a challenge for a lot of people, I think, uh, where something happens that they don't anticipate or expect. But I think one of the things I've learned from the scriptures and, and Esther is that uh, we can all be surprised. Even prophets and apostles can be surprised at the workings of the Lord. And I don't know if they anticipated that they were going to survive this, that the king would change the edict. But, and the Lord didn't promise them. He didn't say at the outset, oh, by the way, everything's going to be fine. And um, so it, it's important for us to remember that, that, that these things can test us. And whatever the outcome, the Lord is good. We know that the Jews prevailed over their enemies and Mordecai prospered, which I love because I, I compared that with the story of Joseph, who was originally sold by his brothers into slavery and spent time by being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and ended up in jail for it. Um, but then he ascended, not out of pride, but out of humility, he ascended to be second to Pharaoh. And as we know, Mordecai becomes second only to the king. The king accepted the counsel of Esther. I, I, one of the things that really struck me was that the Jews didn't take the spoils of their enemies. I think that showed a lot of integrity and a lot of honor that, that they didn't do that. Um, and then we know that the Jews rejoice and Mordecai and Esther declared this annual feast, this yearly feast of commemoration. And they rejoice together in an appropriate way. And I think that's absolutely right. The lesson I've learned from that is that if we do what's right, even though it be hard, God will honor his promise. He will fulfill what he's, he said he will do. He will bring about our salvation in the ultimate sense. He's the source of our salvation. And it is easy to forget that, but we ought not to. What are your thoughts about that, Linda? Well, I'd like to share that, as you mentioned, that um, God will redeem in the long run. Nothing, nothing really illustrates that more strongly, I think, than the story of the Jews and the Jewish people here and the family of Israel. The Jews, spe specifically being one tribe of Israel, Judah, or as Lehi pointed out in the Book of Mormon, any of those who would follow after God and uh, keep his covenants in the temple. Because we know, for example, that Lehi is from Manasseh. He's living down in Jerusalem at the time of the Babylonian conquest. And he refers to himself as a Jew and his people as the Jews. But, um, but what's important here for me is that when you say in the long run, we have to be patient to see God's salvation. The, the plot of the Jewish people is one illustration of that. The Lord loves his people, and the Jewish people have been persecuted throughout time. Here is only one example of that happening to them, that here there was going to be genocide. And by the way, because the king had written this command that on this particular day, everyone could rise up and kill all the Jewish people, he said he could not reverse any command he'd put his name to. So when Esther comes to the king, 
what actually happens is the king makes a new edict that the Jews could defend themselves. And so because we only hope that because this new edict had come about, that there that the first edict was not covered or carried out to the extreme measure that had been in, uh, originally intended. But we know that the Jews throughout time, uh, certainly in the Middle Ages, in the times of the plagues and so forth, and the Crusades, and then also again during the Holocaust, during World War II, the Jews specifically have had so many threats against them to the point that many have lost faith in that covenant. Many have lost the hope and the belief that they are going to be redeemed as promised. I love that in the restoration, Joseph Smith's first thoughts and first prayers were for the Jewish people. And in fact, on the prayer on the Kirtland Temple in DNC 109, Joseph prays for the gathering of all of Israel, but then specifically mentions the Jewish people who have gone through such trial and tribulation that they might be brought home, that they might be gathered back. And he had such a heart and taught us as members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to also have a heart, a great love and respect for the Jewish people. As Nephi points out in his record, where would we be without the Jews? Uh, we're, it's not to scorn or mock them that we have the scriptures through the Jews. We have the remembrance of this covenant because of the Jewish people who, like Esther and Mordecai, even when they were in captivity, remembered the covenant and, and kept that covenant precious to them. And we are promised and told in the scriptures that the Lord himself will deliver his people, the Jews, during the time of the great, great trouble just before the second coming. They are his people. He loves them. And so to your point that we have to be patient and believe that that redemption will come. And sometimes it takes a while and it's not up for up to us to try to figure out how it's going to happen or to make the plan for the Lord. But it's up to us to trust in that plan of the Lord and to have that heart of love for all people, for all of God's children. And I am grateful to be a member of this church that despite many times, even in our own history, and even here in America, where supposedly we have religious freedom and religious tolerance, that there has been so much darkness perpetrated against the Jewish people that as members of our church, we have always honored and had respect for the Jews and for all people of religious faith and values. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Linda, for those those insights and those clarifications, so powerful. And then finally, we have chapter 10. And, and really, this is the culmination of all that we've seen with Esther. This is um, showing us that God really does reward us when we, we strive to do his will, despite our fears, despite our weaknesses. If we strive to trust in him and follow him. He'll save us both spiritually and temporally. And even if we do die in this life, it's better to be faithful to him and to be saved and to be promised a glorious resurrection than not to be and not to be faithful to him. We know that Mordecai becomes next to the king in power. And again, I think that's such an important insight that the influence that God gives us is not simply, it's, it's not about grandeur. It's not about status. It's an opportunity to bless and to serve and to save. And that's why we have opportunities. That's why we seek to do good so we can help and uplift others, not to hurt them, but to save them. And that's really the difference Mordecai wanted to save and bless, whereas Haman just wanted to, to dominate. That's an important reminder for all of us. We know that God remembers and prospers his people in his own time and in his own way. And he really does prosper us in small and, and in large ways. I think about where the church has come from and where it is now. And I think about the house of Israel is being gathered and the Lord is gathering that which was scattered. He's healing that which was broken and he's trying to unify us in Christ. He, he wants to bring us together, not to separate us into factions and different tribes and different races, but to bring us in one. And, and in so many ways, that's, that's an important thing to recall. Um, 
And I've often reflected on how we can be loyal to the covenants we've made and how we can pass that legacy on to our children and to our grandchildren. And I think Esther has learned that lesson. She didn't forget who she was and she was able to pass it on to the next generation. And her story is still being told. She's being honored uh, thousands of years later. She's still being honored as someone who, uh, who was faithful in times of trial and tribulation. And they're the things we remember. We remember the people who showed us courage when it was easy to, to lose heart. So any thoughts about that uh, chapter, Linda, you'd like to share with us? Well, as you were sharing your last thoughts, I was thinking again about your mother. And when you talked about how do we, how do we share the legacy of faith and the legacy of covenant with the next generation? And I think your mother and Esther both went through tremendous hardship in order to maintain that love and loyalty to God and to his covenant. And then that legacy has come down powerfully to you because of it. And I think it is really important for us to, first of all, know and understand what the covenant is. I wonder sometimes if we really do understand what it means to be a covenant people. And I think it's of great importance for us to share that witness with our children, specifically, and our grandchildren, about the powerful gift that the Lord has given to us of the restoration, specifically the priesthood and the covenant and all of the ordinances that we are able to enjoy today, the ordinances of salvation that are available to us through the temple. And I am very grateful for Esther's example. I'm also, Tom, very grateful for your mother's example. I am touched. I am strengthened hearing her story, and I hope you'll share more in the future. I absolutely will. I certainly will share more, lots, lots more to share. And I agree with you that our covenants are powerful. They're protective and they keep us safe from temptation and from evil because we're not immune from the things of the world, but there is a power, there's a, a power in the covenant that as we bind ourselves to, to the Lord, he takes that promise seriously and he gives us his power to do things we simply couldn't do otherwise. Even in our frailty and weakness, I know we're magnified by those uh, covenants. And I, I feel there really are a protection against sin and temptation. And if we will just be observant to them imperfectly, but genuinely, if we try to be faithful to those promises, um, our word is so important. It's important that we do what we say we're going to do, especially when it comes to promises made to our father in heaven and his beloved son. And there is, there is commitment in there. There's integrity in being true to that word. So I'm so grateful for Esther and the opportunity we've had to reflect on her life and Mordecai and these other wonderful people who are real people with real challenges, but they didn't let their circumstances dictate their fears. They didn't take counsel from their fears. And so, um, let's, let's do that. Let's serve God and worship him and be true to our covenants. Thank you 